He should be as much prepared to have his own mind changed as to change the mind of another. Because when you are reading for understanding, you're reading for truth. How you read is honestly just as important as what you read. And learning to read well may be the most important skill you can learn in life. Let's discuss Adler's How to Read a Book. Maybe you got lost somewhere swimming too far off the beach. What's going on, everyone? Welcome to The Cause. My name is Rob, and today we're discussing a really cool book. We are going to be going over what could be the single most important skill in life. How to read a book. And not just read a book, but absorb a book. How to digest the book. Taste some and truly understand others. From the Bible to Aristotle to Jane Austen, the skill and power of reading well can save your soul, change your life, and bring you joy. If you want to participate in what has been called the Great Conversation, it is essential to read well. Not so much to contribute, as only a few have the minds that are capable of doing that, but to at least understand. To understand beauty, virtue, ethics, and what truly constitutes living a good life. One man in the past century did just about more than any other to compile, promote, and share the great conversation with us. His name was Mortimer Adler. He was born in 1902 and he would die in 2001. So this dude was born before the airplane and he would die shortly after Google was found. The changes that generation witnessed just completely blows my mind. How to Read a Book is a book on how to read for understanding versus just for information. Can you not only remember what you read, but can you explain it? If need be, can you demonstrate it? Can you teach it? You can learn by instruction or you can learn by discovery. Reading, because a teacher advised you to fill your mind with information, is reading by instruction. Dates, rules, quotes, major events. But how to read a book is for those who are reading for discovery. Every book you finish is a piece of the puzzle that you are putting together. In a way, it gives a clue to the next book that you need to consume. The more you read, the hungrier you get. And reading turns from a simple task to an epic pilgrimage to whatever it is you're seeking. The concepts in this book are simple, practical, and they're very easy to implement. So I'm going to outline his reading method and share what I think are the major features and the takeaways, takeaways of the book. The book is separated into, into four parts, and we'll start with the four levels of reading. The first level is elementary reading, which is basically what it sounds like. There is a focus on making sure this foundational level is reached because it's so important to have this foundational level before you start reaching to the higher levels. A great quote in this section is this, we must become a nation of truly competent readers, recognizing all that the word competent implies. Nothing less will satisfy the needs of the world that is coming. Adler is saying it's not just for your own sake, but it's for the sake of the nation as well. Basically, it is your duty to learn to read and actually to learn to read well. We quickly move into the second level of reading, which is inspectional reading. We use this a lot in emails and social media content, just kind of choosing keywords, reading key sentences, and basically just moving on. Adler says skimming through the book, reading the table of contents, finding keywords, and then maybe even reading the first sentence or two of each chapter, just to get a kind of a feel in the flow of the book is ideal. For one, it will save you time if the book sucks and it's not worth reading. There are books we have all quit reading just because the book does not satisfy the requirement we had intended. A good analogy here is a jigsaw puzzle. My mom will collect all the edge pieces and she'll put the frame together first and then she'll start filling in the middle. To me that's kind of like inspectional reading. You are forming a frame of what the book is going to be about and if you approve of the frame then you can go ahead and spend the time it'll take to actually complete and read the book. So before we get into the third level of reading, it's important to cover what active reading is. Active reading is just focused reading. Usually, if you are intensely inspectional reading, just kind of skimming through, you're pretty focused. You're trying to figure out what the keywords are, about what the argument is, what's the problem, and stuff like that. To participate in the book, you have to ask questions while you read the book. Questions like, what is the book about? Is the book true in whole or in part? And what of it? And I know some people are against it, but to read well, you have to make the book yours. Mark the book up, write in it, argue with Machiavelli in the margins, cheer on Woolman with an underline, and highlight a quip from Epictetus with a star. Find the zingers in the book and just mark them up accordingly. The more you scribble in the book, the more you make the book your own. You become a part of the book. The more your mind starts to blend with the authors. As Adler says, it's the highest respect you can pay the author. Before we dive into the third and most important level of reading, I would like to tell you about our sponsor for this video, Ralston College. Picking a college is similar to picking a good book. You want something that is challenging and will expand your mind. It needs to be established in truth, 
and have the ability to cultivate a character of moral purpose. Ralston College is currently accepting applications for its MA in Humanities. This program includes traveling to Greece for two months and studying ancient and modern Greek. Ralston's focus is very classically driven, with a commitment to the great text similar to the ones I cover on this channel. From reading Homer in actual Greek to experiencing a very warm place with Dante, Ralston's focus on great literature is unparalleled. They have a very generous scholarship program that ensures that all admitted students can attend regardless of their financial situation. If only we could turn back the hands of time, and Ralston could have been around 15 years ago, I would be much further along in my understanding of Greek. But such is life. I plan to visit Ralston College in the fall. I'm most likely going to vlog and kind of document that little journey, so I think that's going to be it's going to be really fun. I will provide a link below in the description. Please go check out Ralston's website as they have an extensive amount of information, and they even have some free lectures. They have a YouTube channel with lectures on there. I honestly want to thank Ralston for sponsoring this video. Keeping Western culture and tradition alive is something I am in accordance with, and I fully support their mission and what they are trying to accomplish. Again, Ralston's information can be found in the description below. Application are currently open, but the deadline is the end of April, so this month. Go check them out. Now let's get back to Adler's book. The third level of reading is analytical reading. This level of reading goes beyond reading for entertainment or information. At this level, you are reading for understanding and discovery. He goes over some rules such as classifying books uh, before you read them. But a major takeaway here is coming to terms with the author. Adler says, if the author uses a word in one meaning and the reader reads it, in another, words have passed between them, but they have not come to terms. Where there is unresolved ambiguity in communication, there is no communication. The goal of the writer is to make the terms understandable and clear. And for the reader, it is your duty to work with the author to determine the true meaning. Adler also says you operate with meaning that you already possess. This is why I have found reading much easier later in life. I possess more meaning and experience when things intrigue me more. He says terms in longer form turn into propositions, and propositions are nothing but expressions of personal opinion unless they are supported by reason, which we see this a lot nowadays. Unless you can show acquaintance with actual or possible facts to which the proposition refers or is relevant somehow, you are playing with words, not dealing with thought and knowledge. Think about that. It is easier to play with words and mold them to fit a narrative rather than put in the work to find the truth or factual evidence. We see this with politicians a lot, and this next line really sends it home. One of the most familiar tricks of the order, or propagandist, is to leave certain things unsaid, things that are highly relevant to the argument, but that might be challenged if they were made explicit. This is why the long-form podcast has become so popular over the past few years. I feel as humans, we deep down want to know the truth and learn. Adler says that the profit in good conversation is something learned. He then moves into criticizing a book, to read a book well, you have to judge it. Pick it apart. Compare it to what you know is true. Compare it to other great books. But you can't do that until you fully understand the book. Nothing is worse than someone who degrades a book and then they say they couldn't get past the first 10 pages. At that point, you can't have a complete understanding of the book. So the best critique you can actually have about the book is just abstaining from any judgment. You can't judge correctly until you understand, and you can't understand until you finish the book. But prejudice makes us judge so. You may not be teachable on certain subjects that you have a prejudice against. Adler says, teachability requires that a teacher be fully heard and, more than that, understood before he is judged. Aller provides some advice here that I believe is needed probably more than ever nowadays. Do not begin to talk back until you have listened carefully and are sure you understand. Not until you are honestly satisfied that you have accomplished the first two stages of reading should you feel free to express yourself. The understanding of the subject is highly important. He says to agree without understanding is insane. To disagree without understanding is is impudent. Most of the time, we should just suspend judgment, which is also a form of criticism. And with that being said, if criticism of a book is not based in understanding, it is irrelevant. Discard it. Throw it away. It means nothing. He then moves into another topic that I think is very relevant, prejudice and disagreement. Men are creatures of passion and prejudice. The language they must use to communicate is an imperfect medium, clouded by emotion and colored by interest, as well as inadequately transparent for thought. Yet to the extent that men are rational, these obstacles to their understanding can be overcome. Our language is not perfect, but that is why we have the ability to rationalize and use reason. A great line in the book is this one here. The relatively ignorant often wrongly disagree with the relatively learned about matters exceeding their own knowledge. 
Now, I have been guilty of this, entering into conversations I was not prepared for, and out of ego, arguing because I wanted to win instead of learn. But he says, inequality in knowledge is always curable by instruction. Nothing is more of a turnoff than somebody arguing a point they have clearly no knowledge of. Most of the time, that person's focused on being right and winning versus learning and understanding. Eller says, he should be as much prepared to have his own mind changed as to seek to change the mind of another. I love that. So in terms of reading a book, this is a very important concept to keep in mind. He goes into some ways to kind of help you read, and in this section of the book is a little dated in my opinion, but still functional as most of the reading aids are still available. We just have many additional reading aids available to us because of the internet, such as the Kindle and online dictionaries and stuff like that. Now, Adler is not really a big fan of using these reading aids to help you understand. Adler thinks that the growth of reading comes in the wrestling match you have with it. To experience a marathon completely, you can't just hop on a bike from mile 10 to 20 and get off and continue running. I think Adler views most reading aids in that way. You can use them, just use them sparingly. He says they cannot do the thinking for you. You have to think through the book. He quickly moves into how to read all the different types of books from practical to poetry. I will not dive into all of them individually, but there are a few takeaways I'd like to highlight. The next line has sojourned in my head ever since I read it. Your main judgment will always be in terms of the ends, not the means. We have no practical interest in even the soundest means to reach ends we disapprove of or do not care about. Read that over a few times. I have attached that statement to so many things that are going on nowadays, and it has completely blown me away. We focus so much resources and effort on the means, and we completely disregard the quality of the outcome. This is honestly insane once you sit down and actually think about it. He also has a blurb on propaganda that is just magically worded. What reaches the heart without going through the mind, is likely to bounce back and put the mind out of business. Propaganda taken in that way is like a drug. You do not know you are swallowing. The effect is mysterious. You do not know afterwards why you feel or think the way you do. That is another one to ponder on for just a bit. Learning to read well allows you to better defend against the dangerous drug of propaganda. I would love to know how much information we take in nowadays that is actually true versus misinformation and propaganda. He mentions history, and because this is my favorite genre to spend my reading time on, I wanted to point out a few lines from Adler. The first is an important note to remember. History suggests the possible, for it describes things that have already been done. If it happened in the past, then we have reason to believe it could happen again. Adler warns us against reading history in a biased way. You have to read history as a detective, discovering for yourself what truly happened. History is also usually written by the winner, and we have to take that into consideration. Winston Churchill knew this very well as his quip entails. History will be kind to me, for I intend to write it. And write it he did. Adler also goes over reading philosophy, and a couple lines stood out to me. A mind not agitated by good questions cannot appreciate the significance of even the best answers. He really makes it clear that taking the time to think about the concepts in philosophy is just as important as reading the words. I feel we get so focused on the quantity of books we read and the goal of completion of said book that we forget the duty of understanding, which is the point of reading. You may read about the cave in the light in Plato's Republic and then sit down and think about it for 30 minutes. Book closed, just thinking. Then pick it up and continue on. Everywhere I go in my head, I meet Plato coming back. We then take all this knowledge and understanding and we move into the fourth level of reading, which is syntopical reading. Syntopical is a type of analysis in which different works are compared and contrasted. So to make it clear right off the bat, if you want to have a clear understanding of the American Civil War. You can't just read about Grant and Sherman. You also need to read about Lee and Longstreet. And if you just have a military knowledge of the Civil War, you don't really know much about the Civil War. What did the election of Lincoln signify? Who was Calhoun? Have you read Uncle Tom's Cabin? How was wealth accumulated in the different areas of the country? Why was the expansion and the abolition of slavery important to different political groups? We have to broaden our reading criteria and read multiple books from multiple sources, from differing points of view. This is the importance of syntopical reading. Adler says when you read syntopically, you must be the master of the situation. Each book will give you clues and bring you closer to the destination of truth in which you are in search of. You may realize that certain books need to be read first before you proceed to the next. Adler suggests creating a list of questions and putting them in an order and then trying to read to discover the answers. Your answers may differ from what is socially acceptable. You may find that what you have been taught is incorrect. Adler says the syntopical reading, in short, tries to look at all sides and to take no sides. 
A problem with syntopical reading, and not so much a problem as a hurdle to deal with, is deciding what books to read on the subject you are interested in, and then after that, deciding what order to read them in. Eliot's Harvard Classics, which I'm going through on this channel, and Adler's famous set, Great Books of the Western World, are both a perfect example of syntopical reading. The goal is to gain something by each book, but the overall goal is to gain a lifetime love of learning and also to learn how to live. The overall goal is just to gain a character of dignity and respect. Adler ends the book with a strong passage that is more applicable nowadays than ever. He says, Television, radio, and all the sources of amusement and information that have surrounded us in our daily lives are also artificial props. They can give us the impression that our minds are active because we are required to react to stimuli from outside. But the power of those external stimuli to keep us going is limited. They are like drugs. We grow used to them, and we continuously need more and more of them. Eventually, they have little or no effect. Then if we lack resources within ourselves, we cease to grow intellectually, morally, and spiritually. And when we cease to grow, we begin to die. Now we have to remember this was written 50 plus years ago. So much has changed in terms of what competes for your time. The end of the book includes a reading list of like 137 authors in chronological order, from Homer to Alexander, I can never say his last name, Schultzenitzen. We will be covering a lot of these in my series on the Harvard Classics. These 137 authors and all these books build on each other. And this list is basically the foundations, what has been coined the great conversation. With that being said, I'll link the book down below for your convenience. Thank you so much for watching, and I hope you enjoyed this review on how to read a book by Mr. Adler. It's an easy read, so I'd highly recommend any student uh, just entering high school, in high school, or going into college to, to check it out. It's practical, it's easy to read, and you'll definitely get something out of it. So with that being said, read some amazing books, drink some amazing coffee, and I will see you next week as we move in to Paradise Lost. Looking forward to it. Thank y'all so much. Love y'all. She loves the Rolling Stones. Turns up the radio every time that they come on. Never be.